Great. Thank you. Um, anyway, welcome uh, back to the select committee, I mean to the uh, subcommittee on energy and environment. Let me begin by making a unanimous consent uh, request that all members be allowed to submit uh, statements for the record uh, and any questions which they would like to submit to the witnesses who are testifying here today without objection so ordered. Our next witness is Dr. Ian McDougall, McDonald. Uh, Mr. Dr. McDonald is a professor of biological oceanography at Florida State University. His research uses satellite imaging to locate natural oil releases on the ocean surface. Uh, we thank you for coming, Dr. McDonald. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Well, I'm a professor of oceanography at Florida State University. Today, however, I'm speaking solely on my own findings and opinions. If you could move that microphone in a little bit closer. How's that? OK, great. Great. Um, and I, I wanted to say before I embark on technical discussions that I have uh, 30 years of professional and private experience uh, traveling around, uh, cruising on, diving to the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And I deeply and fiercely love this ocean and its people. And I thank you for your exemplary service during this catastrophe. I'd like to comment briefly uh, with a critique on the NOAA oil budget report, which we discussed earlier. I feel that this report was uh, misleading. And although it pre presents science and was done by very competent scientists, without any citation to the scientific literature, without the algorithms, without the formulas and the actual budget that are referred to, it's impossible for someone reading this report to check the numbers that are there. And we have concern about those numbers. Could you move in the microphone just a little bit more close? Very good. A little bit more. A little bit, a little more, bit more. All right. Um, so uh, as I think you very ably uh, demonstrated in your, in your uh, examination, uh, we really can only account for 10% of the oil that was discharged, that 4.1 million barrels that was discharged through burning and skimming. The balance of the oil remained in the environment. There may have been some 10% that evaporated into the atmosphere that is gone from the ocean, but the balance is still in the ocean. The question is, how is it partitioned between the water column and the floating material that will have sunk to the bottom or become buried on the beaches? And this partitioning which was done, or this separation into categories which was done by the oil budget is really pretty theoretical at this point. We need to check on that. There are findings that are coming out that I think will call this into question. But let's just take this 26%, this 1.3 million barrels. As you say, this is uh, five times the Exxon Valdez release. This oil has already degraded, has already evaporated and emulsified. It is going to be very resistant to further biodegradation. This oil is going to be in the environment for a long time. I think that the imprint of the BP release, the discharge, will be detectable in the Gulf of Mexico environment for the rest of my life. And for the record, I'm 58 years old. So there's a lot of oil. It's not gone, and it's not going away quickly. Uh, I'd also, also like to comment on an aspect of the, of, the, uh, of the spill that hasn't received a lot of attention. That's the methane gas. All of the numbers about the release, the discharge, have presented, been presented in volumes of oil, barrels of oil. Uh, if, however, we calculate, we know that the Macondo Field well uh, was very rich in gas, and we have good numbers on that from the, uh, the flow rate technical group. If we take those numbers and we present all of the discharge in terms of uh, units of mass equivalents or barrel of oil equivalents, it turns out that the oil plus the gas is equal to 1.5 times the oil alone. In other words, if we conclude that there are 4.1 million barrels of oil release, the actual discharge and barrel of oil equivalents is in excess of 6 million barrels. Because this oil, this material was released at the bottom of the ocean, it transited the ocean. Some of it, much of it perhaps, still remains in the ocean. So I would contend that for the purposes of the Oil Pollution Act, this was a discharge, and this total pollutant load should be, a, should be included in our assessment of how, how this, this spill went down. Um, 
I'd also like to comment on the so-called resilience of the Gulf of Mexico. Now, a fair uh, reading of the report indicates that this 90 percent, this huge volume of oil, uh, represents a massive dose of hydrocarbons in the Gulf of Mexico ecosystem. There has been some talk about the resilience of the Gulf of Mexico. My concern, my first concern, is not for a whole-scale die-off, but for a depression, some decrease, 10 percent, 15 percent, of the productivity and the biodiversity of the Gulf of Mexico ecosystem. Now, uh, this might be, if we had a 10 percent decrease, this might be very difficult to demonstrate scientifically. It might be even harder to prove in a court of law. Nonetheless, if we sustain this impact over many years, it would be a severe effect. My greatest concern, however, is that some of the damage will be so severe that we may have tipping point effects that will overwhelm the resilience of the ecosystem. And this, unfortunately, has been the case, has been the scientific result, uh, looking at Prince William Sound in the wake of the Exxon Valdez spill. We need to be extremely, we need to hope that this won't happen. We need to do more than hope. We need to watch very carefully. And I have drafted as part of my report, a uh, part of my submission here, a list of species that I think we should be watching closely. These include some of the big species, the shrimp, the tuna, and so forth. Uh, but they also include more humble members of the ecosystem, such as uh, fiddler crabs, uh, the coquina uh, 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 clams that are so abundant on the beaches. We need to be watching these populations through time, not just next year, but for years to come, because it may take several years to notice the impact. Uh, a healthy environment has to support the species that depend on the healthy environment. If we watch those species, uh, we'll know how they go. Uh, I, is my time up? Uh, okay. Yes, it is, but you will have time during um, the question and answer period to elaborate. Um, our next witness is Mr. Dean Blanchard. He is the president and sole owner of, uh, owner of uh, Dean Blanchard Seafoods, located in Grand Isle, Louisiana. Dean Blanchard Seafoods is the largest dockside shrimp broker in the United States and the third largest in the world. Thank you for coming, Mr. Blanchard. Whenever you feel ready, please begin. Yeah, thank you for having us, Chairman. Uh, I want to say uh, we visit your state regularly, and uh, Gloucester reminds me of uh, Grand Isle. But um, uh, we're here today to talk about seafood safety, and we, we have a few concerns. And uh, basically, I, I've taken a moment to outline a few of my major concerns. As an independent seafood business owner of Grand Isle regarding the effects of the BP oil spill, if a seafood product is put onto the market and is later determined to have made it the consumer ill because of all and or dispersant contamination, who will be determined to be the responsible party? Uh, that, that's our, one of our major concerns right now because we're having trouble getting product liability insurance. I've been responsible for moving, I'm just as a guest, but I believe in my lifetime, about 300 million pounds of shrimp. And I've never seen anyone get sick. You know, we, uh, we born in this business. Uh, pretty much everyone in the seafood business is born and raised in it. You don't, you don't just decide one day I'm going to be a seafood business guy. So, you know, we got good you know, people in our business, and we know the shrimp, you know, and, and, I, and I'm hoping that'll, that'll keep the public safe, you know. We, uh, we, we testing our shrimp, we checking it. I, I won't put nothing on the market that I won't eat myself. I stayed about two weeks without eating shrimp, and I felt like I was going to die, and I decided I was going to start eating it again because it was so good. But that's one of our major concerns is who's going to be responsible, you know, the... Uh, I have a feeling this, if I get sued, I'm going to be the one paying the bill. But uh, another concern we got, our, con our commercial sh shrimpers and fishermen are hesitant to fuel up their boats, buy ice and all, and salt, because they believe that open waters will be closed once more, or they will, have to f or they will find all contaminated seafood, which they know I will not buy, and they're going to have to dispose of it. It is, it is difficult for an out-of-work fisherman to pay for these expenses without the confidence in the government who dictates the opening and closures without, and without the, the confidence in BP's press release which states that virtually all the recoverable all has been recovered. You know, we, if you go out shrimping right now 
And you want to catch all? Uh, they could go catch all. But if you want to catch good shrimp, you could catch good shrimp also. So, you know, I told every fisherman, we're going to, you know, when you bring me the product, it's going to be scrutinized 10 times more than it's ever been before. So if you think anything's wrong, don't bring it to me. I will not buy it. I will not take the chance of getting sued or getting someone sick. You know, the last thing I ever want is for somebody to say I, I got him sick or a pregnant woman. Uh, you know, I, that would be hard to live with. So we take an extra precautions to make sure that don't happen. And, uh, you know, we're having a difficult, like I said, a difficult time locating insurance companies, you know, who will sell us insurance. And that's a, you know, that's a, you know, what I'm scared of is not somebody actually getting sick. I'm scared of someone trying to make money off of this, you know. That, that, that's the scary part, you know. And, and, you know, basically in summary, we in the seafood industry, we have little, very little trust in the government, you know. Uh, when, I, when I try to sell seafood, I tell them, I say, well, the government said they did thousands of tests and everything's all right. And they say, is that the same government that said only a thousand barrels a day was leaking out the well? And I say, well, it is the same government, but it's a different branch. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so that, that, that's some of the problems we have. And, and um, you know, we appreciate with the help with people like you that maybe we'll get down to the bottom of it. But I, I firmly believe that all the seafood I've seen so far is safe. Um, I eat seafood probably six, seven times a week. Um, I've, I haven't had any problems with the seafood. Um, so we, you know, we, we're hoping that the government's doing the right job and, and making sure everybody's safe and maybe, um, we could all get through this one day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Plancher very much. And thank you for being here, uh, today. Um, our next uh, witness is Mr. Uh, A.C. Cooper, Jr. He is um, a fisherman uh, from Plaquemine Parish uh, and the vice president of the Louisiana Shrimpers Association. Uh, he is the owner of the commercial shrimp boat, the Lacey K. Um, and we thank you for coming, Mr. Cooper. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Yeah, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the damage is done to our community. Um, this, this oil spill, is, we have all on the bottom. Again, Mr. Mr. Cooper, if I could have just to move that microphone in okay. a little bit. All right. Thank you. This oil spill, we have all on the bottom of our waterways. Um, we, we have reports of numerous fish kills. We know the oil is there. Noah keeps saying that the oil is not there. Everybody says it's not there. We know it's there. I worked in one part of this particular bay for two months. And we wear hazmat suits, we wear gloves, we taped up. They said all is not there. When they got rid of me, the last day I was working for BP, I found all is on the bottom. I reported to the Coast Guard, reported to BP, brought them out there, showed them it was there. This, this has cracked, catastrophic effects on our community, our industry, our way of life. We don't let, we don't, do not need, let, need to let this lay because BP is going to step out of here and they're trying to get out of here now. We need to make sure we stay on top of things because if we let them leave now, we're going to be in deep trouble. Everybody says it's over with, they want to paint a picture that, that in a perfect world, it would be. Right now, as you've seen this morning, 90% of the oil is still there and that's one thing that we are definitely scared of. The places that we do have that's clean, we know it's clean, like Dean was just stating. We worried about when it comes in tomorrow or day after tomorrow that we, we can't fish there anymore. The main thing is that we, we monitor it, monitor the fish areas that are all clean. Let us work in the fish areas that's clean. Where it's not clean, we need to stay away from it. Our fishermen are not going to come in and sell anything that's bad. We want to make sure that we, what we put on the market is, is good. That's one of the main things that we discuss. We have meetings on our own and we do discuss this. Now, we need to make sure that, that BP stays in place for as long as it needs to be. Because we see right now that they are trying to move out and they are trying to go. We don't, we don't need to let them leave now. Finish the job they started. They did it. They need to clean it up. Like Dean said, we get somebody sick, it's going to come back on us. The, the process of having a doc sign 
uh, waiver saying that um, we caught them in open, open, open areas in the marsh. They're making us sign waivers that we caught them in open marsh. Now, who are we going to make and hold responsible for that? Is BP going to step up and be responsible for what, what we have to do? I signed it for Dean. He signed it for the processors. Who signs for us? So we're going to wind up with the burden of having to hit the blunt of this. We can't even make any money. It opened on uh, May 16th, I mean, eight, August 16th, the season. I went out. Normally I catch a couple thousand pounds to 10,000 pounds. I caught 500 pounds of shrimp at $1.25. Them same shrimp last season was around two, two twenty-five. They done went down one dollar. Now, if I can't get the price for my shrimp and I can't catch them, how am I going to survive? I've been doing this for 35 years. My father's 74 years old. He still does it. My sons do it. Hopefully, their sons will do it. Hopefully. I don't see any future in it. With the prices and everything that's going on now, we may not have a future. Who's going to be liable for that? BP needs to step up and make sure they pay us for what's, what they've done, keep this industry going. Our docks can't afford to keep going. What happens if they go out? One link is broken this chain and we lose our industry. This is something we've been doing all our lives. Who do we go to then? I just want to make sure uh, they understand that we are not happy with what's going on right now. They say it all is gone. It's not gone. It's on the bottom. We can take you and show you. I brought the Coast Guard. I brought BP and showed them. You stir the bottom up and it all comes up. So whoever says they're going, as you heard today, they said 75% was gone before, 95, 90% 90, 90 still there. And it is going to come into our shores eventually, somewhere. If not in Louisiana, somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And uh, just so you know, the reason that we're having this hearing is that BP knows that we're not going away. Okay? We're, we're going to stay on them until they do the job. We know that BP did not stand for be prepared. Uh, right from the very first day when they said there was 1,000 barrels per day, uh, all the way until today, they never had a plan put in place to deal with something like this. Uh, and uh, we just can't allow them to believe that the coast is clear, that uh, they can retreat uh, without having to pay for everything that and, and they are responsible. Let me say one more thing. Um, in the areas, you heard him talking earlier about five-mile bumpers. I, well, I found all out the season was open in that area this last, the 16th. It was open where I found all that. And then they're talking about um, uh, 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 a give uh, a, a trade off, trade off for the dispersions, and the only trade off that we feel they gave off to is our, our industry, because when you sink it like that, we can't see it coming in. Our, our shrimp fishing, all the all bottom feeders. That's where it went to the bottom. So it's a deeply concerned with us what's out there coming in on our bottoms. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cooper. Now we'll hear from uh, Mr. Uh, Mike uh, Voisin. Wasan. Wasan. Wasson. Um, he is the chief executive officer of uh, Motivated Seafoods, an oyster processing plant in Huma, Louisiana, a family-owned business. Uh, the Wasson family has been involved in the seafood industry since 1770. Uh, Mr. Wasson also serves on the Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries Commission the Louisiana Oyster Dealers Association, and the Louisiana Oyster Task Force. We welcome you, Mr. Wasson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Uh, the opportunity to come before you is a pleasure today, and thank you for this opportunity. And may I, may I also say that in Congress, there are two places that everyone thinks has a very funny accent, and one of them is Louisiana, and the other one is from Boston. So, uh, <laughs> so this is a gathering of those. The other 48 states, they all think they speak plain English, but we know that our accents are the authentic ones. So welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, our company uh, has an oyster farm in South Louisiana that comprises about 10,000 acres of water bottoms. Uh, we produce anywhere from 45 to 75 million individual oysters annually. Uh, and on the bottom, we always have two to three year classes of oysters or 135 to 225 million 
uh, oysters on the water bottom at any time. In addition to running my family business, you mentioned my relationship with the Wildlife and Fisheries Commission of Louisiana as a member. I'm also past chairman of the National Fisheries Institute. Uh, Louisiana is second only to Alaska in total seafood landings. In 2008, our commercial fishermen harvested one and a quarter billion pounds of seafood, which represented nearly 660 million in dockside value. Uh, meanwhile, 3.2 million recreational fishermen along our shores took to the water, completing a total of 24 million fishing trips. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill is clearly an ecological and human tragedy that will surely affect not only the fragile habitats where fish and shellfish are harvested, but the very core of the community that brings these iconic delicacies from the waters of the Gulf to the tables of America. That culture and those Americans need your support during these challenging times. The seafood community has been actively engaged with both state and federal officials as they closely monitor the Gulf waters and only now begin to reopen those waters. We have worked closely with NOAA, the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, Department of Health and Hospitals, and other groups, the Environmental Protection Agency as well. We strongly supported the precautionary closures uh, at the outset of this tragic event in order to ensure consumers continue to have access to seafood maintained with a level of quality and safety expected in the Gulf of Mexico. And now as we did then, we support regulators as they reopen those same waters and continue their ongoing efforts to protect consumers. We agree that closing harvest waters, which could be exposed to oil, was the best way to protect the public because this prevented potentially contaminated seafood from entering the marketplace. Closures made with the intent to ensure seafood was as safe as possible were balanced with not closing any fishing areas unnecessarily. And as a testament to that system, we know now that no contaminated product has made its way into the market. Waters are reopened only when oil from the spill is no longer present and the seafood samples from the area successfully pass ch chemical testing. Sensory analysis testing is heavily established verifiable and highly scientific is a heavily vi viable and scientific way to detect contamination. That testing continues aggressively as well. In fact, FDA has collected 5,658 specimens in NOAA, uh, as well as NOAA, that all of these samples have been 100 to 1,000 times below the threshold levels for any margin of safety relating to any human health concern. The Gulf Seafood community applauds the administration for, taking, for taking the lead on the coordination of the comprehensive multi-government to collaborative efforts of NOAA, FDA, EPA, and the state authorities, including the Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals. We are pleased that the state agencies are working closely with the federal government, and we're thoroughly confident that every necessary step is being taken to ensure the continued safety of seafood sourced from the Gulf. After thousands of tests, the public should not be concerned about the seafood safety of Gulf seafood. We've seen all the media reports raising questions about that same seafood, which stand in contrast to all the federal and state testing we have seen. It's absolutely critical to the Gulf seafood community that a consistent and precise message <coughs> continues to be delivered to the consumers who may unnecessarily shy away from this otherwise very healthy product. The Gulf of Mexico has 600,000 square surface miles of water. During the 100 days or so of this event, the Mississippi River carried 1 trillion 600 million plus gallons of water into that Gulf of Mexico. We know it's 5,000 feet deep, probably more like 10 to 13,000 feet deep. There's a lot of water out there. Uh, we have corresponded with doctors, MDs, and we've spoken to scientists. We've educated ourselves and understand that the demonstrable risk from dispersants is negligible. And we hope further studies will be able to help consumers better understand that challenge. I'd like to thank you and the administration for all the efforts that you're putting forth to make sure that we continue to do the right things relating to this seafood concern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Wasson, uh, very much. Uh, and uh, we uh, thank the uh, members from the Louisiana delegation, Mr. Melanson um, and Mr. Scalise, for 
uh, their work in helping to make sure that we uh, keep BP accountable uh, and the government accountable uh, to ensure that the uh, innocent victims of this uh, continue to be uh, protected. Our next um, uh, witness is Dr. Uh, Lisa uh, Suetoni. Uh, she is a senior scientist in the Oceans Program at the Natural Resources Defense Council. She earned her PhD in Ecology and Environmental Evolutionary Biology from Yale University. We welcome you, uh, Dr. Suetoni. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Mr. Chairman, recent communications by the federal government on the oil spill have been optimistic. We are hearing that pieces of the puzzle are falling together, that the picture looks better than many of us had feared, and that we have turned the corner. However, previous experience from um, other oil spills tells us that we are only at the beginning stages of this event from an ecological perspective, that um, the story is necessarily complex and many unanswered questions remain. In my testimony today, I will focus on three recent actions from the federal government that have raised concerns. First, the concern, concerns the trade-offs associated with the use of dispersants. As we heard from Dr. Anastas today, the EPA conducted recent toxicological study on the dispersant Corexit, and we heard that Corexit had equal to toxicity to other dispersants that um, Corexit had much lower toxicity than the oil itself, and that the Corexit oil mixture had about equal toxicity to the oil, at least to two test species. However, um, with the release of these findings, the federal government concluded that the picture is becoming clear, that the use of Corexit was an important tool in this response. While it may be tempting to conclude that use of dispersants was a wise decision in this oil spill, we think that conclusion is premature. As you already mentioned today, we think it is unwise to use to form that conclusion on the basis of two tox toxicological studies and observations in the field that corrects it is at exceedingly low concentrations. As you pointed out, um, you raised many qu important additional questions today and there are additional ones, too. For example, what proportion of the oil that would otherwise have ended up on the coast didn't because of the use of dispersants? Where is the chemically dispersed oil? Is it encountering vulnerable benthic ecosystems on the shallow shelf or in deep ocean canyons? Is the chemically dispersed oil um, more able to get into the food chain than the oil alone? Is it getting into the food chain? Is it possible for the dispersant to biomagnify in the food chain? These are all outstanding questions. It is clear that the use of chemical dispersants is a trade-off, but it is not at all clear that we understand what trade-off we've made. On the remaining oil in the environment, we've already heard a critique from Dr. McDonald about the federal oil budget, and NRDC agrees um, with him that the assertion that 75% of the oil is no longer in the environment is an overinterpretation of the data and misleading. Because of the uh, uncertainty associated with the rate of biodegradation of the oil, we really don't know how much oil remains in the environment. This needs to be directly measured. If you um, do a more direct interpretation of the federal oil budget, it reveals that 50% of the oil may remain in the environment. That is over 100 million gallons, or nine times the Exxon Valdez spill. That is a lot of oil. In addition, the federal oil budget appears to be a preliminary budget that was perhaps prematurely released. It was released before peer review. It was released without any discussion of the precision associated with those estimates. It is a partial tally of the hydrocarbons in the environment. Again, as we've heard today, it didn't contain methane, which scientists believe comprised half of the, to of the total hydrocarbons that went into the environment. And it was a partial analysis of the fate of the oil. For example, it didn't provide estimates of how much oil went into an oil slick, or what proportion of the oil made it to the coast, or what proportion of the oil is now on the sea floor. 
As presented, the federal oil budget was a partial snapshot of the oil in time. It doesn't directly address where the oil was, where it is going, and how long it will remain in the environment. And it, of course, didn't address the ecological impacts. To fully understand the risk of the remaining oil or the impacts to the environment, these, this picture needs to be filled out and the oil budget needs to be refined. Relating to the safety of seafood, recent statements from the federal government made today, in fact, assure Americans that the open fishing grounds and the seafood in the market have no oil in them and, pre and present no health hazard whatever. Again, many important questions remain. My colleague, Dr. Gina Solomon, who's in the health program at NRDC, highlights three primary concerns that we have. First, much of the data and the contamination of the Gulf seafood are not publicly available. So scientists cannot independently review the findings. NOAA has released data on fewer than 100 of the samples out of thousands that they say they have, and only on finfish, not on shrimp. Data from the state waters has not yet been released. Second, the seafood monitoring that is currently being done may not be adequate in terms of sample size and in terms of um, n failure to monitor the heavy metals, which you've discussed today, and uh, the dispersants. Third, assumptions used in the FDA risk assessment fail to adequately account for exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons to vulnerable populations, mainly developing fetuses, young children, and subsistent fishing communities. And that's because, largely because of um, the assumptions you already raised about the, adate, the weight of adult males. In conclusion, the Gulf oil disaster represents, is the largest oil spill in U.S. history. We understand that the government wants to turn the corner and wants to signal that the Gulf is on its way to recovery. However, the facts simply do not bear that out. There is still a huge amount of oil in the environment. No matter how you interpret the federal oil budget, everyone agrees with that. It does a disservice to the Gulf region and to the public at large to diminish the problem that this oil presents to the health of Americans and the ecosystems of the Gulf of Mexico. The government needs to take the time to do a careful study to assess the fate and the effects of the spill and greater transparency is warranted. In the end, we believe that this follow through is the only thing that will keep this catastrophe from being such a big disaster. Thank you, uh, Doctor, very much. Now we'll turn to uh, questions from um, the uh, committee. And I'll begin with you, Dr. McDonald. I think that there is a lot of concern about how far the oil and methane from the spill has spread in the Gulf. How long uh, it will remain and what harm it could cause. I know that these questions are areas of active research for you uh, and for the broader academic community. Can you give us a brief overview of what academic scientists are finding in that regard? Well, this week and today, in fact, we've seen the release of a number of, of careful studies, uh, one by the University of South Florida reporting on results from a recent research cruise with the uh, research ship Weatherbird, a careful study of the oil budget by uh, a scientist at the University of Georgia in Athens, and today, a, a release of a major paper published in Science by Richard Camilli and, and colleagues. Um, these reports collectively show different aspects of the, 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 the spread of the oil and its related compounds um, that raise major concerns. Uh, the Camilli report uh, documents the, and this is a, a, the best science that I've seen yet out of this, uh, out of this report, out of this process. The Camilli report documents the uh, spread of compounds called BTEX, and these are the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and the ones of greatest concern, these are benzenes, xylene, toluene, so forth. These are the most toxic components of the oil, and they track a very large uh, plume of this material spreading to the south and the southwest of the spill. Now, I will note that in that 
uh, report, they document that some six to seven percent, I believe those numbers are correct, of the BTEX released from the well, the total discharge, was included in that plume. This plume was at 1,100 meters. If that BTEX is a tracer on the total amount of, of oil released and entrained into these deep water layers, that suggests that we don't know very well what happened to the balance. And in fact, the upper layers of the ocean, including the surface of the ocean, may have received a bigger dose of oil than we're presently uh, worried about. Um, we do know from my work and other work that's been done that the oil spread over an area of many thousands of square kilometers. And uh, as it degraded, as it emulsified and sank, it rained down particles uh, of oil. And this oil became more concentrated as it reached the coast. So we now have a very widespread uh, amount of oil that's scattered in layers. And this is what the um, uh, findings from the Weatherbird documented. They took core samples going towards Panama City, and they found oil on the bottom everywhere. Now, just sampling with a core, that suggests that either you're very unlucky or there's a lot of oil on the bottom. Uh, and the uh, uh, Georgia study uh, confirmed many of the points that have been made um, uh, in this uh, hearing. Okay, great, thank you. While this hearing was ongoing, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute released uh, a study, and it's a snapshot from the middle of June, uh, and what they found was a plume of oil from the well at least 22 miles long, 1.2 miles wide, and 650 feet high at a depth of 3,000 feet below the surface in the Gulf. And contrary to government oil budget report that said dispersed oil is biodegrading quickly, Woods Hole scientists found that microbes are degrading the plume relatively slowly, in the words of Woods Hole. That means that the oil is persisting for longer periods than expected. They don't know how toxic it is or if it poses a threat. And unlike some other research researchers, they did not find areas of severe uh, oxygen depletion, uh, in, uh, that is dead zones. Uh, they explained this discrepancy because of their use of an older lab-based technique rather than the use of modern sensors, which can give oxygen readings that are too low when the sensors are coated with oil. So I just wanted to put that uh, uh, on the record. Mr. Cooper, how many years have you been uh, shrimping? Uh, 35 years myself. Now, have you been out shrimping recently? Yes, sir. On the 16th of August, it opened up. I, I went that day. Now, did you see anything different or unusual in terms of the waters or the shrimp? Uh, not in the area I went, which we didn't have a whole lot of concentration all come in. It was a clean area. So, no, at that point, I didn't, I just didn't, didn't have enough shrimp. It, it, was, it wasn't there. Uh, Dr. Suetoni, would you like to uh, comment on that in terms of long-term impact? Well, we are concerned um, primarily with regard to the shrimp on the presence of the subsurface oil and, and that there are, you know, as Dr. Cooper said, that their oil is present in open grounds and that there may be more exposure. The um, marine invertebrates do not process polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons as quickly as finfish. So we think there needs to be special care taken with the sampling of invertebrates. Okay. Uh, Dr. McDonald, would you like to comment upon? Well, I think that the survival of the Gulf seafood industry requires the survival of seafood. And we have to be concerned. I mean, this is an anecdotal. This is one fishing trip, and I'm sure you've gone out before, Mr. Cooper, and not caught as many fish as you wanted, or Correct. As you wanted to. So this one event doesn't <laughs> tell us the whole story. But the fishermen are not, you know, however healthy the seafood is, if they can't catch it, because there's been a loss of some year classes, um, then uh, all of the, the, the protection and the, the vigilance of the FDA is not going to sustain the Gulf seafood industry because they won't be there. So that's my concern. Mr. Cooper, are you going to go out shrimping again soon? Yes, sir. Sure what, will. What, what is your plan right now? Uh, when I get back home, I will be back in the water. Okay, great. Now, 
Mr. Cooper, are you convinced that there is no oil in the areas open to shrimping? Like I told you earlier, once, by the way, I did find oil, was, they say, a five-mile bumper zone. It wasn't five miles. That one of the bays I, I did find oil in. Now, in your opinion, is there any way that NOAA or the FDA can be sure that there is no oil uh, in the water where shrimping is taking place? Uh, I found it the last day when I was working with BPR, I worked two months in the same area. And just so happened, one of my last days that I worked, we found it. I called the Coast Guard and BP and had them come out there, and I had to bring it to their attention. The Coast Guard wouldn't come. Finally, I caught one that was in the bay and brought him over there and showed him. So I went to a town hall meeting, and I brought it before them and invited them all to come see what I found. And they did come. The commander, Coast Guard, and BP came with me, and I did show them. In this bay, you stir up the bottom, and it all comes to the top. And they say it's unrecoverable all, but still yet, they opened this bay up for trawling. Now, Mr. Blanchard, some have suggested that people raising concerns about the quality of seafood simply want to continue to collect checks from BP. Can, no. you, can you deal with that issue for us, just so we can understand what is going on down in the Gulf in terms of the relationship between this program to pay the fishermen who need to be paid. Well, I, uh, I but don't. Again, an incentive to get, get back out there as soon as you can. Everything is okay. So how should we be viewing this tension? Well, we, uh, I told BP from the very beginning that they was going about it the wrong way. What we asked them to do was to, to help the fishermen and give them an incentive to go back fishing. If they would have left the, the fishermen fish, even though they'd had to go further away from their home, even though they'd had to go to different fishing grounds, well, pay them for that. Give them an incentive to go out. Then it would have kept the market going, you know. Mm -hmm. But BP took the approach that they was going to do a PR program and put all the shrimpers to work for them. But in my opinion, BP never tried to pick up the oil. They have never tried to pick up the oil. They, they, I've, I've talked to countless boats, hundreds of boats, that said they found oil, contacted oil, contacted BP, and BP told them not to try to pick it up and go the other way. You know, and this has been going on for hundred and some days. I've lived through this. You and know, why, I, why do you think that is the attitude of BP? It was cheaper to sink it out of sight, out of mind, and out of here. That right. that's the approach BP took. I you see. know, but as far as going back to seafood testing, our seafood right now is probably being tested more than any other product in the world. You know, uh, uh, I don't believe beef or pork or any seafood in the world. We, we get seafood from foreign countries that personally I wouldn't eat. It, it's personally being grown in a sewer and, and the FDA checks one to two percent of it. And out of the one, two percent they check, 40 percent of it to 60 percent is no good, is rejected. So, you know, uh, that, that's one thing I want to bring on. Our, our seafood right now is being tested more than any, probably any product in the world. So hopefully they're doing the job and they're doing it right. What I'd like to see is for one time before I die, is somebody that works for the government be held accountable for something. Whoever's testing it, whatever agency's testing it, they ought to come out and give us a paper and say, we guarantee this product is good. And if something goes wrong, they'll be held accountable, not us. Well, you know that's why we're having this hearing. <laughs> Thank you. You know that's what is happening here today. We're sending a very strong signal to those who are responsible that well, that's they, what I like are, to see. they are representing to and I the think American if they people would that this is safe. Yes. I think if they would be held accountable, people would have more trust in the government agencies. But, you know, there, there's certain government agencies that's, that's responsible for this all spill where nobody's being held accountable. Well, you know, we're, we're going along, you know, beginning with uh, the minerals management. Uh, that's and that's one I'd people, start there's with. There's a lot of people, there, there are a lot of people there who are going to be made uh, accountable. Uh, and... Uh, and we are going to move through this entire process. We are not going away. We are going to make sure that all of the lessons that can be extracted from what happened are learned and implemented uh, in order to protect the public. Mr. Cooper, in your testimony, you indicated that BP required you to wear a hazmat suit when you went out into the waters. How long ago was that? Oh, let me go two weeks ago. 
Uh, now you are being told to head back out into the same waters without any additional protection. Is that correct? And that's very troubling. Yes, it is. Um, do you think that you're being asked to work in an unsafe environment? Not necessarily. Uh, some of the areas, is not, they didn't have the all. So uh, I, don't, I don't see in them areas that I, it is unsafe. But in some of the areas, yes, it's unsafe. If they're going to make us wear hazmat suits and tape up and take hazmat training, how can you send our fishermen back out here? But some of the areas, yes, where never, they all never came, no, it's not bad. And, and speaking about the VU program, look, some, some of these guys had to take these jobs instead of fishing. And I know there's a big controversy in Louisiana right now. A bunch of people wants the fishermen to go back to work. We only have limited areas to fish. They want to put these guys to stop the VU program, the, the, the working in with, with BP, and put them back in the waters and make them go to work. But then they're paying us lower prices. We're paying high fuel prices. The price is not there. We don't have the area to work. So, so these guys have to do it. With the open and closing of the seasons with uh, wildlife and fisheries, they pretty much had to do what they had to do. And if, they, if it means going out there and work for BP to make a living, well, so be it. That's what they had to do. Now, in your testimony, you indicated a smaller than normal size catch this week. Have you noticed any other changes uh, to the shrimp or to the fish, the color, the size, the, sm the spots, the smells? Not in this area, no, sir. It, Not it, there. Okay. Fine. This area was a clean area. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wasson, would you like to uh, inject your thoughts at this point? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say that there are two small areas in South Louisiana that have um, been oiled, and that is the Barataria system where Mr. Cooper actually harvests and Mr. Blanchard has his dock, and then out at the mouth of the river, Pasalutra. We have 7,500 miles of shoreline in South Louisiana. If you go in and out every bayou and around every bay and lake, only about 400 miles of those were oiled. It happens to significantly be where Mr. Blanchard and Mr. Cooper are located. Seafood from throughout Louisiana is safe. Uh, it is wholesome, and uh, while there can be questions raised... Uh, You're saying that the seafood which is being sold is safe, but there are yes, many sir. areas where if it was caught and sold, it would not be safe. Is that what no, you're sir. saying? No, the seafood... You're saying all seafood caught anywhere off of the coastline of Louisiana is now safe? Is that what you're saying? All the seafood caught off the coastline of Louisiana is now safe and it's put into the commercial market. Yes, sir. There's 87 percent of our state is currently open to the harvest of seafood. That occurred last weekend as a result of the intensive testing and protocols. And I know we've talked a lot about protocols today and about the dispersant testing and oil testing. Looking at the risk assessment based on the protocol, Mr. Chairman, I took a look at it. And in terms of oysters, they, oysters are consumed at about a quarter of a pound per capita consumption. In the risk assessment, uh, they used a number between 9 and 10 pounds per capita consumption on an annual basis. And they figure that exposure at five years. So we've got, they're exceeding the per capita consumption by 40 times and the exposure by five years, and they're looking at the risk of illness at one in 10,000, which is traditionally looked at as one in either 100,000 or one in a million. So that's being magnified significantly, and we're meeting by 100 to 1,000 fold all of the criteria in the reopening protocols. Okay, so, so I just want to, again, yes, sir. I just want to again clarify you're not representing that in the areas, the federal waters that are now closed, that it's safe to eat the fish that is caught in those areas. You're not saying I, that. I did not say that, sir. Yeah, I you're said not saying the, that. In the okay. open waters uh, where fish are being harvested and commercially sold, uh, I would feed it to my kids, my wife, and we do eat it often. Yes, sir. Um, but in those other areas, you do as, not believe, as, you would not feed, the, you would not feed that fish to your family the, in the waters that are now closed. In, in the waters that are closed, we can't. I mean, we can't. No, that's harvest what I'm, them that's what I'm so, saying to you. So the bottom line is that as they do the reopening and go through the protocols, absolutely, I would I would feed that to my family. Let me come back to you, Mr. Father. Cooper. Can you give us 
uh, a comment, and then you, Mr. Blanchard. Uh, Would I eat the shrimp? I, 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 we've been eating them. I have been eating them. Uh, not in the areas that are closed, no, I haven't ate them. But uh, the ones I caught, I did eat. I, I will eat them. Yep, Mr. Uh, Mr. Blanchard. I definitely eat them. I don't think there's no difference on what's open and what's closed. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Dr. McDonald, could you comment here on can, and, divide, and divide the question here for us in terms of what you believe is safe and what is not safe and how the American people should be viewing this? Well, I would it, certainly eat them too. Um, and uh, perhaps I can have the occasion sometime. I, I, I will say that um, my concern remains the productivity, not the safety. I think that we have to have a productive Gulf. And you know, the 350 mile uh, statistic is, is heartening that it could have been worse. But as you move offshore, you get a lot of areas that have got oil on the bottom you know, further out. And, and as you go to the east, we see a lot of oil off Mississippi, Alabama, uh, and Florida, my state. Uh, in those areas, when people go offshore and take samples, they're finding this buried oil, and they're finding this buried oil in the beaches, and they're finding this oil in the marshes. And that 350 miles did get a lot of marsh, did get a lot. And the edges of these marshes, um, where, the, where the, the marsh grasses were oiled, my concern is that, you know, if, if it dies back 10 percent or 5 percent, that opens up, that dilates these channels, that makes them wider. That means the flow of water through is, is greater. That means the loss of, of, of wetland is greater. Um, we have a tremendous amount of work to do to restore the Gulf of Mexico. We had a lot to do before all this, and now we have a whole bunch more. Um, so my concern is the, is the ecosystem and the productivity. I believe in the fishermen and the, and the FDA in, in protecting our safety. But Dr. Uh, Dr. Suetoni, you've heard the comments uh, on this question. Could you uh, add yours as well? I would like to emphasize, build on what Dr. McDonald said, but emphasize that long-term monitoring is, is imperative. What we learned from the Exxon Valdez spill was that oil that gets into the coast and in, into low oxygen zones stays toxic in its kind of full toxic form for decades. And anytime it gets disturbed or it rains, it can seep into the environment. And these near coastal fisheries, I think it's important that they continue to monitor for the exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and metals over the long term. You know. Can I ask this, uh, Dr. Suetoni, was there anything that was of concern to you um, that you heard on the opening panel from the government officials? What is it that stuck up that you think needs more attention? A few things stuck out. St stuck out. Um, one was that they're only now developing tests to um, examine whether or not dispersants bioaccumulate. That seems to be something that we should have known since dispersants are a common tool in oil spill response. Another thing um, that you know we are concerned about is that the risk assessment used by the FDA is not adequately conservative for specific vulnerable populations. It was reassuring to hear that they are um, open to reconsidering that margin of safety. And um, I, I would say with regard to seafood safety, those were the, the two primary concerns. Was there anything of concern, uh, Mr. Wasson, that you heard in the opening um, the testimony that you would like us to continue to focus on? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I would say that uh, I, I stated earlier that uh, in response to Dr. Sue Tony, is that how you say it? Sue Tony, thank you. Uh, that uh, I feel that the uh, risk uh, assessment that deals with the protocols for reopening basically are are much more conservative than than there should be any concerns related to. I think they have they have gone way beyond what would be conservative to the nth degree, and I described that a moment ago in my answer to you. But even though even though you heard concerns about heavy metals and other I, issues that you I do, do that, yes. that is I've, not of concern to you? Having, having spent countless hours talking to PhDs as well as doctors relating to this uh, and the metabolization of all of these things through finfish and shellfish, uh, 
I personally think that there's no concern relating to those, although there's a concern, and we should be concerned, the, uh, in terms even, of the Even oil though there have never been any studies in this subject, you still have no concern? I personally do not, no, sir, yes. given, given the Do you have concern, uh, Mr. McDonald? Regarding the government report? About the, any, any aspect of this, including the testing for heavy metals and the other issues that seem to still be unresolved? Yes. My, my concern is for the coastal and marine ecosystem of the Gulf of Mexico. I'm concerned that I have not yet heard from NOAA their plan for monitoring the continued health of this ecosystem. And I think that when we look at the oil spill budget, uh, it's uh, unmistakable that an enormous dose of, of, uh, of oil was given and really, putting it simply, Mother Nature is being made to clean up our big mess and I think Mother Nature suffers for it. I think that we need to endow a permanent fund for the restoration, the understanding and the sustenance of the Gulf of Mexico coastal and marine ecosystem in perpetuity and I don't hear that coming from NOAA and I, I would like to hear that. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Blanchard, Mr. Cooper, Mr. Wasson, everyone wants the Gulf seafood industry to rebound from the BP disaster. Your industry did not cause this mess. Your industry, your business, and livelihoods were harmed by the spill. What would each of you ask the federal government to do to help establish the safety of Gulf seafood and to help reassure the consuming public about the safety of Gulf seafood. You, you heard the questions that I posed to the government panel that appeared here earlier about the need for additional tests to be done uh, to help address some of the issues that have not yet been definitively address, such as the metabolites of the oil, the effect of dispersants, heavy metals, and long-term impacts that this disaster could have on the quality and productivity of seafood in the Gulf. Um, do you agree that those should be priorities, and what other issues would you like the government to address? Well, what I didn't like, what I heard about the government, it looked like they were just checking the open places. If it would be me, I'd go to the worst place and check that first and then see what I'm looking at. You know, it looks like the, the every time you, you listen to the government, they say, we just checked the open place. Well, why don't we check the closed place and see why it's closed? Mm -hmm. You know, nobody seems to be checking that. And, you know, uh, we've been severely harmed by this, by this, you know, Bob, you call them, I call them bad people, BP. Uh, you know, since this happened in this hundred some days, I got my secretary to look at the bills we paid. We paid $488,000 in bills, and I received $165,000 in, in payments from BP. And, you know, and, you know, it reminds me, I heard the president say that he wasn't going to let our cash flow be interrupted. But if I don't have $323,000 to pay my bills, I'm out of business. You know, why is nobody holding BP accountable to come in and make it right what they've done to us? Well, I'll tell you one thing. This committee wants to work with you, Mr. Blanchard. We want to make sure that BP stands for bills paid. Yeah, and, that and, sounds better. And that includes your bills, Mr. Blanchard. So <laughs> let's work together on that. Make sure your bills are paid, but other people's bills as well. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Mr. Cooper. Uh, just to make sure they keep long-term testing, that they just don't forget about it. And, and one other issue as far as uh, what's going on in the Gulf now with the, the vessel opportunity, Steinberg's trying to take the money that we made working with BP off our claims, and that's not fair for the fishermen that went out there and did the job. We was cleaning their mess, and now they're going to hold us, our claims, towards that money, our, that money towards their claims, and, that, and that's not fair for what we just done. We went out there, we put our lives on the line, we, we cleaned their mess up, and now they're gonna take it against our claims, and that's totally wrong. Uh, for BP to even think about so doing something like this is, is uncalled for, yep. because we did a job and we expect to get paid for the job that we've done. Thank you. Mr. Wasson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I believe that uh, long-term testing is critical to the 
the Gulf and the survival of the Gulf. I believe that uh, the state of Louisiana, I know that the state of Louisiana has requested $457 million from BP for a 20-year testing program. We've not approved it yet, but it's needed to continue to monitor the health of our species, the viability of its reproductive cycles. But more importantly, one of our great challenges is the brand of the Gulf of Mexico. The brand of Gulf seafood has taken the greatest hit in the history of my seven generations of family that have plied the waters of South Louisiana. People need to understand there may be questions, but there's no questions about what's in the market today. That there may be questions about fishing areas that are closed, and we should ask those questions. But that product that's in the market today is wholesome and safe based on tremendously conservative science. And we need to convince those American people. Uh, customers at restaurants are now, instead of ordering oysters on the half shell, very close to my heart, uh, shrimp cocktails. They're saying, instead of having that as an appetizer, I'll have chicken wings. And instead of having that grouper as my main course, I'll have a steak. We need to overcome that. A hundred plus days of oil gushing in the bottom right-hand corner of a TV screen has branded us as something other than we are. We have a challenge. We will meet that challenge. However, the challenge is in a very small part of the whole Gulf of Mexico. We need to look at the whole. It's 200 million gallons of oil that has escaped from this situation. We need to deal with it. We're blessed in the Gulf of Mexico with having the microbes that will eat oil. That was not the case in relationship to the Valdez incident, where they don't have the warm water. We're cursed with that warm water and that warm weather as well. Would you like to see more testing in the areas that have the heaviest concentration of oil right now? Would you like to see that implemented now so that, I, I we'll have that, in, that we will have that information in the long term going forward, Mr. Wasson? Would you like I, I to see? I think it's happening, uh, Representative Markey. I believe that that is happening. Uh, could more, more is better. Uh, I think no, Noah we, we heard on the opening panel that there was no intensive program to do that right now. You would like to see that kind of intensive Abs program I have right now? I, I would support that, and I've been on conference calls with Excuse Noah. Excuse me? I've been on conference calls with Noah where they, where they have reported they're doing testing in the closed areas. I've been on conference calls with the FDA as well. Uh, so now, that's what they've indicated on those conference calls, that they've done testing of seafood products in those areas. Uh, they've done oil plume testing, uh, and they have indicated that they are continuing to do that. Uh, today, uh, I forget the guy from so, NOAA. So, so you, you want them right now to be testing the fish inside of the closed areas. You want that to happen? I, I believe, Mr. Markey, they are. Yes, I do want it. But if they are not they're... doing it right now, you believe it's important for them to test the fish inside of the most oiled Absolutely. areas right now? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, great. That helps us a lot. Um, so let, let's do this. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we ask each one of you to give us uh, your closing thoughts uh, in reverse order of the opening statements so that we have a sense of what it is that you want us to uh, retain, to focus on, uh, as uh, we are going forward in the uh, congressional oversight uh, of uh, this greatest of all environmental uh, calamities. So we'll begin with you, uh, Dr. Suetoni. Thank you. Um, NRDC is concerned with the recent tone of the communications and um, analyses coming out of the federal government, that there is a desire to rush to judgment, to turn the corner and, and accelerate um, the analysis of the impacts the oil has had on the ecosystem. And it is of great concern. According to the Oil Pollution Act, the federal government is required to fully and fairly assess the impacts of the oil spill. And we hope that they take the time and do the necessary comprehensive study that's required to get that done. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wasson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico states, uh, the state of Louisiana that I live in, 
have been challenged in the last five years by five major events, this spill being the most recent significant event. Uh, we will be scarred, uh, but we will not be broken as a result of this. The seafood community is a viable community. My family left France uh, under exile orders in the 1770s, went to Canada and was kicked out of Canada. So far, we've not been kicked out of Louisiana, and hopefully that won't occur. We will be resilient. Uh, you know, people aren't really interested necessarily in the rough seas that you have, but whether or not you bring the ship in, and we're going to be about, and I hope the federal government continues its effort and doubles them if appropriate and needed to bring that ship in, and that is safe seafood, a clean and healthy Gulf Coast. We'll have scars from this, just like I do from different accidents and challenges in my life, but I'm viable. The Gulf is a viable place to live. The seafood is wholesome and safe that's harvested from the Gulf of Mexico, and we want Americans to know that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wasson. Mr. Cooper. Long-term testing on all, um, testing on a correction, and also testing on our, our, our harvest and our, our, whether it's been depleted or not, the stock assessment to see what's happening to our, our, our fisheries. Because uh, with this last season, they just opened, you really opened your eyes and said, if they wasn't there, what's going to happen? So, so that's some of the things that we'd like to see testing on our on the correction for, for sure, no doubt, and all, and all for long term. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blanchard. Yeah, thank you. Well, basically, for 28 years of my life, I've had a product that's always been known as the best because it was the best. And I, I just like the perception of the American public to know it's the best again, you know. Um, we work, you know, in our business, we don't work uh, nine to five, we work five to nine, you know. We work seven days a week, it's, it's, it's my life. Um, I, I guess I'll say like Tony Haywood, uh, I pretty much want my life back. <laughs> you know, I want my life back. They took everything that I worked for all these years and, and, and one, one company don't know what they're doing or cut too many corners and, and, and put me out of business. I mean, just ruined my whole life. And, and nobody's, nobody's, being hold, nobody's being held responsible but me. And I didn't do nothing wrong. I, I mean, I'm just so confused. I, I, I go to work like I always do. I walk around in circles, don't know what to do. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it, until it would happen to you, 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 you know, until you live through what we're living through, you know, we, it, it just, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, you know. Every night I go to sleep, I can't sleep. I lay down on my bed, I, I know how many squares I got on the ceiling, you know. Um, you know, I, I just hope that the government get, you know, makes BP clean everything up and everything returns back to normal and, uh, and, and the, the American public has confidence that the seafood that we're going to buy, we're not going to sell them nothing I wouldn't eat myself. And, and the last thing we want to do is get anybody sick. And we'll do the best that we can to make sure everything's all right. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Blanchard. And to you and Mr. Cooper, uh, we thank you for coming here thank you. today. Thank especially you for We know that you're individuals who have a tremendous amount at stake here and uh, and just so you know that if at any point tomorrow next week next month that uh, you can just dial our number here on the committee to help you personally with your own family situations as you're going forward uh, and uh, we will give you the number to call as soon as this hearing is done just so that you know that there's someone who will be behind you. Okay? Thank you very much. It takes a lot of courage for you guys to be here today and we appreciate that. Uh, Dr. McDonald. BP is going to have to pay a fine, Mr. Chairman, a big fine. And my concern is that that fine be dedicated to restoring the Gulf of Mexico, not disappear into a treasury somewhere. And I hope that the houses of Congress can work together and the parties can work together to guarantee that the money that is paid here go into permanent 
restoration projects. I'm talking about restoring marshes. I'm talking about marine protected areas where they're needed. I'm talking about um, better enforcement of coastal runoff. Those are all things that have to happen to make our Gulf whole again. That's what we all want. If you all will do that, you will have massive support from the people of the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McDonald, very much. And I would also like to add, Dr. McDonald, that the House of Representatives just three weeks ago did adopt one of your recommendations to the oil spill response bill that we passed uh, on the House floor to create a new trust fund for oceans so that funds raised from drilling in our oceans will also go towards protecting and improving our oceans. Uh, the Senate has said that they will take up the legislation when they return in September. Um, that's always problematic, uh, dealing with the Senate. But we did, in the House of Representatives, take your recommendation and implement it. And hopefully, the same will be true in the Senate so that it can go to President Obama's desk. Uh, what we have learned today is that the oil is not gone. The oil remaining in the Gulf waters or washed up on the shore is equivalent to 10 Exxon Valdez size spills and could be much more. Most of the Gulf has been reopened to fishing, but the industry is not in the clear. Long term impacts on stocks remain unknown. One contaminated catch makes it uh, to market and makes people sick, then the reputation and the credibility of one of America's most important fisheries will be in jeopardy. So we must engage this issue with continued caution and vigilance is necessary. We have seen some premature celebration. Uh, dispersed oil is not the same as oil which has disappeared. Data, formulas, algorithms need to be made public so that independent scientists can verify the conclusions that are now shaping the debate on what to do now. We need to test the fishing stocks in the closed fishing areas now so that we understand what is going on now. That will help us in the future to protect the fishermen, to protect the consumers of uh, fish uh, in our country. But we must spend the money now so that in the future there are no questions that are unexamined, that we ensure that the compensation is given to those who will need it for as long as possible uh, until we make everything as safe as is possible. Uh, all of that is, uh, in my opinion, uh, going to be something that this committee uh, and the American people will need to be vigilant to ensure uh, is put in place so that the people in the Gulf of Mexico, at the end of the day, are made completely whole. Uh, BP, in my opinion, will try to walk away as fast as they can. Uh, BP lowballed the size of the spill in the first week, saying it was 1,000 barrels. Then they said it was 5,000 barrels. They knew in the first week that it was a huge spill. It turns out to be between 53,000 and 63,000 barrels per day. That is not 1,000 barrels. That changed the level of response in those first weeks in those first months because of the misleading information. People were less um, vigilant than they would have been. The response was less intense than it would have been if we understood the magnitude. We must continue that level of vigilance. We must assume uh, that we need to use all of our resources to understand what is going on right now uh, so that in the future there can be the proper protections which are put in place uh, and that the proper compensation is given uh, to all of those whose lives have been adversely affected by what has happened. So while BP might be spending tens of millions of dollars 
on their television commercials saying that they're on the job. Even today, we identified many questions which have yet to be answered in a satisfactory fashion. Uh, and we, may, we need to make sure that they are for the long-term well-being of the residents of the Gulf. We thank you all for being here today, uh, and we hope to be able to stay in close contact with you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Hey, good evening. Good, evening. good evening. Good luck. Good luck. Congratulations on your In a few moments, President Obama encourages senators to pass a small business bill after the congressional recess. In about five minutes, we'll look back on congressional testimony